Hey everybody, my name is Isaac. This is the Colony Drop Podcast, where we talk about everything regarding Gundam, from the models to the shows to anything else that's new and interesting. I'm here with my co-pilot, Brian. Hello everybody, and today we're going to talk about what is the state of Gundam in America today, as well as how can Sunrise uh, make it bigger and better and give us more Gundam. Hmm. Interesting. So, what do you feel the state of Gundam is in America today, Isaac? Do you feel we are ascending declining we are ascending using almost all of our veneer thrusters (laughs) and i'll tell you why we are doing this because gundam is available on a lot of the major streaming channels netflix hulu probably amazon and that's pretty important as far as exposure for gundam also i mean the models the models are you know They've always been interesting and uh, entertaining. That's not necessarily going down, but the models kind of go hand in hand with, you know, the shows. And there's a lot of shows available right now on streaming. What do you think, especially compared to years ago? Well, that's right. So we we went over all those shows on streaming uh, or available on streaming in the last episode. I think that's a big indicator of, of where we're going with Gundam. I do think that Gundam was maybe declining a little bit after maybe before the the whole streaming. Uh, era started Um, so maybe in like the late 2000s early 2010s before streaming was like super huge i feel like gundam going into the early 2000s had a big push due to all the uc series coming over and then seed coming out uh, right after that push but then I, i feel like you know the uc series didn't catch on super big and seed came and went um and i feel like seed did pretty well on toonami but then after that, I feel like there was a little lull. But now I feel like, like you said, the streaming is giving everything a little bit of a revival, especially with Unicorn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, UC is, to an extent, you you kind of have to dig up the show to keep watching it or know the whole thing that ha- know everything that happened in that timeline. You have to watch really old shows. It doesn't really do Gundam too many favors if you're someone that doesn't like old anime or just old shows in general. But as far as new stuff, it's it's a great time to be able to watch Gundam in America. It's on Netflix. There's two shows on Netflix. But do you think that where, that Gundam is where Sunrise wants it to be in America? No, I think Sunrise would ideally like Gundam to be as you know iconic and recognizable as say Star Wars or Star Trek. But that's you know realistically speaking, yeah, Gundam is like that in you know Japan where it's much more recognizable and it's pretty much their star wars but here you know it's going to take a while for people to look at that and not see you know japanese anime robot and instead think oh i definitely know what that is that's a gundam right so what do you think the best way to get to the american audience is what has been what has america loved over the last 100 years over the last 100 years (laughs) Yeah. Uh, what is America best at? What is one of our best exports? I don't know. What What, what is one of our best exports? Block, <laughs> blockbuster films. That's true. Yeah. We're pretty good at the, uh, the massive action films, right? Over the top sparkling explosions. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We, we specialize in exporting Michael Bay explosions to the yeah. to other countries. Where do they love them in China? <laughs> <laughs> so in, in 2018, Sunrise announced that they will be making a live action Gundam movie uh, produced by or probably co-produced with Legendary Entertainment. Um, so that's the producer who made the Pacific Rim titles and the new Godzilla monster verse series. So Godzilla, Kong, Skull Island and uh, whatever the last one was called. King of the Monsters. Oh, yeah. Godzilla, King of the Monsters. I think we can all agree those movies were fun. Yeah, they Uh, made money at the box office, I think. And, you know, people enjoyed it. And particularly Pacific Rim seems like a a good match, given that it's the only franchise I can think of that has successfully put giant robots on the screen in a believable manner, and and people enjoyed it. Pretty much. I mean, well, there was that Power Rangers movie that came out not too long ago, and that they're remaking a Power Rangers movie soon. So it's we're going to see a Megazord again. But, I mean, a live-action Gundam movie sounds awesome. I mean, okay, here's my concern. <laughs> <laughs> my concern, all right, remember there's going to make an Akira movie? Which one? Because they've yeah. been trying to make an Akira movie, I think, for 
30 years now in, in Hollywood. Yeah, sure. and yeah. It still, it well, still hasn't happened. Right. But my point is, okay, are they going to like put the Gundam in like, you know, Washington DC or something? <laughs> and then like, I don't, I don't know. The, the pilot is, you know, Anthony Ray or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think that's a valid concern, right? Because it's while... gonna get, like whitewash for lack of a better phrase, American wash, what have you, West wash instead of being, you know, close to, you know, what it should have been and staying close to the story. Yeah, I think that, I think those are all valid concerns because Pacific Rim, Godzilla, look, I saw those films. I really enjoyed them. They don't, they don't, definitely don't have the same weight to me as a Gundam story does. So I'm, I'm a little wary that maybe Gundam needs to be about giant robots, but it also needs to be, yeah, I, I don't want to call those movies bad movies because they're they're not bad movies but gundam needs to be a good movie if that makes sense they were definitely shallow films i must say gundam is anything but shallow and even if it's you know a film topping out of two hours maybe longer i don't think you can cram the one year war in that time frame i mean was this going to be like part one and they hope like to keep doing more um there are no plot details still there is no title um, so really, we know nothing about it. Legendary, you know, they they have made films along the line of what we're talking about that are that have depth that they're they're good. So for example, they made the um, the Jackie Robinson movie Forty Two, um, which was a really good movie. And they they've taken some some good steps, I think, for this film. Um, they've hired Brian K. Vaughn to write it. Uh, he's probably one of the, mo- the one of the most well respected comic writers from the last twenty ish years. Um, so he's written. The comic series Why the Last Man, uh, Ex Machina. Uh, he created Marvel's Runaways, uh, which is now a, a Hulu show. And but he currently writes a very highly acclaimed comic called Saga. So they they hired him. I mean, he he's a great writer. I trust him based on his his work. I I feel like hopefully the fandom trusts him as well. But I do agree with the last thing you said, which was I don't know how you cram you know, the one year war into one movie. Do you think they do? Cause again, there's no plot details. We don't know if it's a universal century side story. We don't know if it's an existing alternate timeline um, or if it's just going to be something completely original. If you had to guess, what do you think they're going to do? I'm going to guess one of two things will happen. Here's option one. They pretty much take something that already exists and condense it, or at least use the best parts in it in whatever, you know, the, the two-hour movie that it's going to be, if that. All right, maybe they're going to condense, I don't know, a uh, seed or, you know, maybe they'll take the actual one-year war or whatever. You know, for all we know, it's going to be a story about, like, a kid and build fighters, you know, so that the kid can relate to it and then maybe marketing hopes that the kid, the, the kids watching the, the movie end up, you know, going out and buying their own models, whatever. Okay, so that's option one, where they pretty much copy an existing series or movie that already happened. Option two is they make something wholly for the U.S. slash international market. So it can be, you know, maybe make nods to previous things that happened in other series, but it can be completely on its own. It could even be based in our real world where, I don't know, the military builds a Gundam for whatever reason and, you know, it fights, I don't know, Rogue Nation Gundams or something. (laughs) Rogue Rogue Nation mobile suits for all we know. Sounds an awful lot like your favorite series, Mobile Fighter G Gundam. Oh, boy. Yeah. (laughs) If I had to bet, though, I'd say we'll see everything Gundam iconic, but uh, condensed somehow for an American viewer. We'll see colonies. We'll see space travel, beam sabers, um, the story of somebody inevitably finding a Gundam and becoming its pilot, probably a rivalry with some type of red mobile suit. And uh, yeah, it'll be Gundam by the numbers, but condensed and uh, Hollywoodified, um, if you may, using you know our usual slew of I don't know. I, I, Liam Neeson is the, the the captain, and then <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I don't know who can they get for the pilot. Oh, Zac that, that's Ef- a Zac whole... Efron as the Gundam pilot. <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole episode right there. We can do yeah. assuming that they were to redo the uh, you know Universal Century, we could just do fan yeah. castings for the whole. Uh... Right. Oh, that's that's gold. Yeah, the we'll, moment, we'll the moment we find out what they're kind of basing it on, if yeah. they are, then we're gonna just start pulling actors left and right, right and actresses. Yep. So, <laughs> so I think Char, yeah, Brad Pitt. Yeah. <laughs> too old. Yeah. We'll no, he's too else. old. Yeah, uh, I think Char was supposed to be nineteen in the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Of course. Um, 
So yeah, I guess we'd have to choose. Even Zac Efron would be too old now. I think he's in yeah. his 30s at this point. All right, we'll look at you know the cast of whatever high school movies people yeah. are watching now. So whatever. Look the, at the cast of All American. <laughs> yeah, whatever the current Disney Disney Channel people are. But yeah, I think that's a good point. You're right. We'll probably hit all the high points. You'll probably have a a young boy slash or maybe even a female lead. I don't know. Maybe um, anything's on the table. I yeah. mean, we're in a new age in Hollywood. Anything can happen. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. It could be a good opportunity. I don't think Gundam has really had a super strong female lead character where I would say she's... There's, I mean, there's definitely a lot of strong female characters in Gundam. I don't know if any of them are really the main character. Am I correct in thinking we've never had a single female lead pilot? Um, 0080 had Chris, Christina, Mackenzie. Um, she was she the main character. Yeah, yeah, well, she was like the main character on the Federation side. But yeah, yeah. I would agree. Uh, she wasn't the Bernie or whatever was the was the main character. Oh, oh I don't oh, think so. Long overdue. I'd have to. I'd before I definitively make that say, statement. I, I think I'd have to think about it. But I, I think you're right. For sure, to um, know. Yeah. So that 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 could seem likely to me, um, especially with the success of like Star Wars recently with you know Ray. They they could be looking into that. So I do think we're gonna get like you said hi, all the highlights. Young protagonist, uh, antagonist with a red mobile suit. Exactly. You know, beam weapons. Definitely something with colonies and hopefully a colony drop. Quasi fascist villains. Right. Yeah. Possibly Particularly in today's world. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a story about immigration. Very topical. Inequality. The colonists <clears throat> being equal yeah. to the uh, Earthborn elite. Yeah. I just don't know how you fit a whole <laughs> one year war into a into a two hour film and and do it well. So that that does concern me. So yeah. maybe it'll be There's somewhat no of a smaller scale conflict, or um, worse, or worse. Brian would be it's about humanity or whatever the U.S. government building a Gundam to fend off an alien invasion. <laughs> oh no! If we go there, oh man, I I, I believe we have Sunrise. have to see it regardless. <laughs> oh, we're definitely going to see it. I mean, I believe Sunrise is involved, so I doubt they would approve. An alien angle, but you, you mean like know. they approved one in Double O? <laughs> well, but at least in Double O, that kind of alien that, approval. <laughs> at least in Double O, that was a you know that wasn't the main thing that they were presenting to the, the American audience as the first full length feature film. I'll give you that. I'll you give know. you that. They only showed up in one movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you got they were pretty yeah. nebulous as a threat until the end. But yeah, exactly. Now, granted, there has been a live-action film before. When I was like looking this up, I was funny because I was reading the original Deadline article. It was either Deadline or Variety, whichever one. Uh, and he did say, you know, it'll be the first live-action Gundam uh, feature film. And I was like, well, no, that's it not won't. exactly <laughs> true. There, there was this, you know, as we discussed nice try, last Sunrise. episode, there was this uh, <laughs> great piece of filmmaking done called G-Savior. Um, uh, but but I, I do think, you know, no one... No one remembers G Savior at this point, right? So oh, if your son right, do, <laughs> well, some of us do, Brian. I, I think they, they've already got us. I don't think this film is for us. So you ha- you have to think, right? That Sunrise is they're, they're going to put their best foot forward with this. I hope they march every like producer and writer and you know the director in, into like a small theater and then show them G Savior and then like <laughs> the angry board of directors at Sunrise just starts yelling at people in Japanese <laughs> when the movie's over and like the message gets across that they can't repeat any of that yep. <laughs> in any way. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like this is Sunrise trying to make a big move for the particularly the US market as well as you know whoever other markets who who love like live action blockbuster films because i i wonder if they were emboldened after the gundam appeared in ready player one do you think that gave them more or less confidence in this project i mean that was such a a fun but small easter egg i can't i wonder how many people that actually saw ready player one i don't think it made a huge amount of money i think it did well how many people saw it and were like oh Japanese robot. <laughs> and how many of us were like, oh, of course, we knew it would be here. <laughs> it's a you know, it, it did pretty well. It, it made uh, about almost $600 million at the box office. Okay, good. Um, so I think it did pretty well. I don't think there was a... I don't, you're right. I don't know that everyone watching it knew, knew what it was. Right. But I don't think that anyone left that theater not thinking, you know, that was, that was pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. I wouldn't when, say it was so much testing the waters, though, for Gundam specifically. 
but I mean, it looked good on screen. I mean, it looked yeah, I agree. Good. I, I don't think it was a test. I mean, why not? I think yeah. it was more just if you had to be happy, right? If you were Sunrise and you saw that, yeah. And and I'm sure that, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen really negative reactions to the, the Gundam's appearance in that in that film. No, um, no, that film. I mean, anybody watching that film, I imagine that had a general idea it was about knew that they were going to see a lot of you know kind of nostalgia kind of geek nerd culture sci-fi stuff and um that was just you know a cherry on the sunday right yeah another way to look at this is they've hired brian k vaughn which is great but he's not necessarily in charge of the film he's just the writer because um, that's not how hollywood works so the not. producer of this film is uh, a man by the name of kale boiter so I don't really know anything about him other than what IMDb can tell us. I sound like the pilot of, of like a <laughs> GM or something. Yeah. Uh, Kale Boyder, he's going to provide combat support. <laughs> but it's, it, it's you know, from what a, a quick quick search on him, because um, I think you can get a sense of, of films based on their producer, because um, they're, they're sort of in charge of where the film right. goes. And, right. The um, shot caller. The big yeah. cheese. Yeah, exactly. So... The films he's he's done that he's famous for are Noah, Detective Pikachu, Dune, the the one that has not come out yet. I, I believe it's it must be wow. film. Pacific Rim Uprising. So that was the sequel. Mm. I don't I don't Mixed believe reviews. he yeah. worked on the first one. I personally felt the first one was better than the second one. And Journey to the Center of the Earth, I think, is the other one that he's he's known for. He's obviously worked on a lot more than that. Oh, he worked on Wedding Crashers. Well, he gets my vote then. <laughs> Oh, and the butterfly effect. I think that was another one that he was oh. supposedly famous for. Wow. Okay. So hopefully, Mr. Boyder pulls it through. I think he already did a good job if he was in charge of hiring Brian K. Vaughn. Um, I have no idea if Brian K. Vaughn's even a Gundam fan. I assume he is to take the job. I imagine a skilled writer would be able to maybe absorb the material he needs and then, you know, put out a quality script. Right. Especially with his, you know, he deals with some heavy stuff and Why the Last Man and some of his other work, so I, I'm optimistic about him, and then everything you just told me about Kale, I'm optimistic about him, too. I agree. So I, I feel like at this point, it's still okay to be hopeful. Would you yeah. agree? Absolutely. You know what? We can be hopeful until we start hearing otherwise. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if the critics start saying, like, oh, God, this was a, you know, a hot, it was a hot mess and a train wreck, then we can walk into the theater kind of thinking, okay, you know, we, we should expect the worst and just kind of enjoy the nonsense. But um, let's stay hopeful until we have reason not to. I'm kind of excited. I mean, it's one thing to go into the theaters, even small theaters, and you know, see a Gundam movie. It's another thing to go in and see like a live action movie in a big theater. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And some fans, maybe some listeners who are a little bit younger, maybe they don't have a reason to be skeptical. But for those of us who maybe have been around a little, little bit longer, and saw G Savior, that the prospect of a of a blockbuster live action movie. That that's always been, I think, a dream. I, I don't know that we ever thought that that would actually happen. No. For those of you listening who have no idea what G Savior is, G Savior came out in the late '90s, I believe, and it was live action Gundam. It was a direct to DVD or yeah, direct to DVD movie. Oh boy, where do I begin? Okay, it, <laughs> it, they there's like, it's just like really dated computer graphics that they used for the Gundams and the story was kind of a mess. It was very, it was very much a made for TV movie type fight feel to it and low budget and overall n not very quality. It's maybe the lowest quality, anything Gundam. Now that I think about it, I mean, even some of the short series had better quality or series that got canceled early, like a Gundam X, you know, compared to G savior, it's, night and day it doesn't even feel like gundam really yeah I, I think and i think we talked about this last time but i i i believe that that was more of a a test on on sunrise's part of like can we do this then maybe more more of a test than a, a super serious effort but it, it, it ended you know the way what? it ended and here we are <laughs> you know what sometimes when you test something you get out what you put into it and they put in the bare minimum into that movie hey look in the movie business you, you gotta recoup your investment man you, you can't you can't let it sit on the shelf <laughs> i imagine they recoup their their <laughs> their 20 dollar yeah i hope they made it back in like the the 10 dvds <laughs> that they sold <laughs> 
Well, I actually bought one, so. You know what? Anybody out there who's listening to this, if you're a fan of G Savior or you really enjoyed it, not even really enjoyed it, if there's a lot of it or part of it that you enjoyed, <laughs> please contact us or leave them leave a comment. Tell us what you enjoyed <laughs> about G Savior. <laughs> Was it the acting? It could be the mobile suits. Do you do you really feel a an appreciation for for the G Savior or the silhouettes or any other junk? I would like to point out that it's only episode three of this podcast, and we've already talked about G Savior, and I think every episode. <laughs> it it's hard to ignore. It's like a it's like an accident on the side of the road. Like you're gonna look at it as you go by. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, did you see that? <laughs> But yeah, I did. we have to go out our day, but I did see it. <laughs> just a just a flaming slash burned yeah. out G Savior wreck just on the side car of the road. Looked over on fire. <laughs> you're like, oh well. But but no one no okay. one stops no one stops to put it out. No, we try to ignore it once we realize how bad it is. <laughs> he just Tamino just drives by when he when he sees it, lets it go. He just, he just shakes his head. <laughs> <laughs> you should have you should have filmed Guy Gear as he just drives drives away. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. God, Guy Gear looks so beautiful. It looks very cool. The, the designs to them are just, yeah, awesome. For those of you um, who don't know what Guy Gear is, <laughs> Guy Gear takes place in like way distant UC, um, far future, and the mobile suits look pretty different than anything else in any Gundam series. They're very kind of almost organic. I describe them bio organic in a way. It's yeah, I would I would say they look kind of like a three-way cross between Gundam, the Giver, and like Zone of the Enders or something. That's a great, uh, yeah, definitely a, a Giver influence maybe there. It's very, um, put it this way, if you had to grow Gundam or mobile suits, that's kind of what they look like. <laughs> yeah, I don't, even know if, uh, I don't even know if Guy Gear's canon anymore. I think that got overwritten or Probably well, it only existed in like written form. So yeah, if anything's in written form, whether it's like a novel or just a manga or comic or whatever, um, it's way easier to overwrite than if it was actually like an animated series. I feel, yeah, yeah. or an early two thousands live action movie named G Savior. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I mean, if they don't, <laughs> no one buys it. I guess uh, maybe it doesn't you know, exist. But- you know what? I'm banning G Savior for the duration <laughs> of this podcast. We can't we can't be stuck on this. We have other stuff to talk about. <laughs> what else should we talk about, Brian? Uh, so I guess it, so. Going back to this, the, the live action film where we're hopeful. Yeah. What what are your? Uh, I would love it if they did this, and the, the opposite. Your please, if anything, do not do the following things. Please do not do a forced, unconvincing unnecessary love story we don't need you know the pilot that just found the gundam to also fall in love with his or her new lover and then uh i don't know a hug or a kiss before the final battle blah blah blah. it's too much it's too much it should just be about them finding the mobile suit and then you know going off on the adventure what i want to see is i want to see a really good space battle i feel like if they're trapped just on earth fighting it's not going to be too gun enemy. It's going to be very Power Rangers ish, too much. You know, we're going to have, you know, oh, they take out the sword and then they're still fighting on the ground and then he he slays the one enemy mobile suit. Yay. And, you know, they're destroying <laughs> buildings at the same time, right? When they're fighting, because they're always yep. fighting in the city. They're always knocking over these damn buildings. But, but if it's Angel Grove, that means everyone's yeah, going to evacuate. Ex- <laughs> exactly. Conveniently. But, um, if they're in space, we get those awesome space battles with like the different fleets, you know, mobile suits doing all those crazy maneuvers and all the beam weapons. It'll it will look pretty awesome, I think. Especially based on everything you told me about Kale. Like we could almost get like a a saving private Ryan of Gundams. Like it's really gritty and you know, but at the same time very um sci fi kind of action fun. Yeah. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. You're right. I don't know that we've had outside of like Star Wars big space battles would be could be they could use space battles as like a defining feature of the film. Okay. Yeah. All right. I know we just had Star Wars movies come out, but come on everybody, we we could have used some more space battle. <laughs> yeah. Right? I don't think anyone would turn down more space battles, right? Especially for example in Pacific Rim there are no space battles. No. So that's one way to make it not feel like Pacific Rim. 
but that also goes back to the whole i don't know how you fit all this in because like in the original mobile suit gundam they start in start in space go to earth go back to space um you probably in only two hours you probably can't go back and forth too much no i mean so we're good we're gonna get one tr- we're gonna get one trip right either either space to earth or earth to space i mean i'm concerned we might get one battle you know for all we Agreed. know it's, yeah yeah for all we know, it's going to be about, you know, the pilot, you know, being told he has to, you know, oh, there's this new weapon you have to learn. Like, oh, no, I must be in the cockpit of my Starfighter or whatever. And then it's about him training and learning. And then, he, I don't know, we have a mission, we have a Top Gun kind of thing where he falls in love with his trainer or whatever. Uh, and then at the end, it, leads, <laughs> it all leads to a final battle with, you know, the the evil red mobile suit that's been plaguing their their forces. And, oh, he defeats it at the end and roll credits. Right. Now, I, I, Gundam is about war, so there's going to be multiple battles within a single war. And, you know, we really have to capture the scale of that because so much of those battles in the series, any series really, are kind of about the the pilot getting trained, you know, has to fight this mobile armor. Then he has to fight this group of mobile suits. Then he has to fight, you know, this fleet using this weapon and blah, blah, blah. And just keeps going and going and going and building up. And uh, that's how the, uh, the suit gets upgraded. The pilot gets better. And, uh, you know, the, this, the show uh, keeps raising the stakes as it moves on. Um, I think you had mentioned before you went, you were wondering if they had maybe planned this to be a, a series of movies. Um, yeah. I mean, they have, they've not announced that. And I, I'm sure in their mind they would love it if it was successful and they could make more films, but they definitely won't make that decision until they right. at least have a finished version or close to finished version of the film, because that would be yep. All right, can you make the one you war in three two-hour movies? Can you do it in two two-hour movies? Well, you could definitely do it in three because you know there are the Mobile Suit Gundam compilation films. Right, but I mean, movies are kind of different. I, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, so you can do it in three. Could you do it in uh, two? I would. I would do it. I would definitely say you could do it in three. You'd probably have to use some time lapses. Yeah. Um. To to just just assuming that you start with a sort of novice pilot, you you the whole three movies can't take place over three days. Like we they would need to show that this kid's been fighting for months or whatever and has gotten really good at what he's doing or he or she's doing. Um, True. Yeah. But three movies definitely seems more doable than, than one. But I think the only problem is they don't know if they're going to get three movies. And so they're only going to green light one. And that would be, so, so this, whatever movie they're making has to stand alone um, because it, it could just fail. Like it, it would be way too ballsy to, to spend $300 million or $200 million on, part one of something that you don't know you're going to get to release the next two I, there's no way i think it couldn't even be a side story because that would kind of be robbing the gundam from the audience in a way you know we we can't do a side story in the uc that's there's too much backstory for people that you assume that they know so it, it'll have to be about a gundam i agree it'll definitely be about a gundam what if they did a so this leads into my what do i what i what don't i want and what i what would be my, my dream scenario? So what Tenzel. I definitely don't want, what I definitely don't want is aliens. I think we already covered why. If they, oh, yeah. I, I swear if they released the log line and it's like, you know, humanity creates the Gundam to fend off like yeah. an alien invasion. Of, I, at that point, I don't know what, what the difference is between this and Pacific yeah. Rim. Oh um, God. Can you imagine a scene where like Gundam, what is a Gundam? Yeah. It's for global United network <laughs> alien, you know, military. Or they're like, Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that should be a bet. Will it will it or will it not be an acronym? Oh god, you know what they would call the aliens too, right? Let's assume that like there's these green tentacle things. They end up calling them the Xeon. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, Xeon. They're they're from planet Alpha Xeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the Federation would be like a UN that just you know, we've been fighting them with our shuttles and our ships, but it's not cutting it. So we build a Gundam. Oh god, I don't even know if I would see it. Uh, I don't know. If I'd, I don't know if I'd pay for it. I'd bite the bullet. <laughs> yeah. I'd yeah, go for it. You're, you're right. I'd probably see it. Yeah. I'd, I'd get plenty of candy. I'd get like a big IC <laughs> and I'd be like, all right, start the projector and let's, <laughs> let's get this let's, circus let's get this started. Going. <laughs> yeah. Put my oh. feet up and say, yeah, show me this junk. Throw it at my eyes. Could be, yeah, it could be so fun. Um, but what, my dream scenario would be going back to this is only one film and I don't know how you do the one year war in one, in one film. If it was a, some sort of side story like eighth ms team and you could do a very brutal is probably the wrong word but almost like just treat it like a war film 
almost mm-hmm. like what you said earlier, Saving Private Ryan. Like, what if it was, you know, an apocalypse now, but it was it was Gundam and it had a lot of political commentary because, you know, Brian came on. He did a fair amount of political commentary in Why the Last Man. So it's something that he was pretty skilled at. So I don't know. Could be a, could be a good fit. That's probably not what they're going to do. I'm sure they want the big one year war blockbuster or equivalent. So many good um, visuals in it. I mean, but you're right. It, it, always MS Team could be a great movie because there's so much you could remove. It would make it, le- it would have less depth, but um, you could definitely make that a two hour movie. I mean, it's pretty much a team on a mission to take out a weapon, a super yeah, weapon. So exactly. It could be the Rogue One of Gundam. Pretty much. Oh, there you go. Wow. Brian, goodness. You should write scripts. <laughs> if this is successful, if this is successful, put together your O eighth MS team script. <laughs> yeah, I just I feel like something shorter yeah. and more contained would maybe work better for the one film format. We need a digestible story for an American audience. Yeah, it almost has to be for someone that's never heard of Gundam, never seen it, and likes science fiction or action movies. That's about it. Yeah, that's probably their goal. That's your jumping point. This, yeah. yeah, this is for someone who's never seen. Never we seen. For, we got to prepare for it to look different. There, there look. may be a scene where the Gundam carries a giant American flag. We don't know. <laughs> as it as it fights some some enemy nation. <laughs> oh boy! Plants it on a mountain. <laughs> and then and then in the sequel he, he fights Godzilla. Probably or the, no, they team up <laughs> <laughs> to fight the Zeon invasion. Of course, yes. Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. Bad. Yeah, probably. So anyway, we remain hopeful. I think yeah. at this stage for this film, and comment that is... below if you <laughs> if you have any thoughts about the movie, what you want to see, what you don't want to see, what you actually think will happen. Are you optimistic? Do you think it's going to be a train wreck? <laughs> yeah. I think if you're a Gundam fan already, then what you want to see versus what they're going to do are probably very different. And also, I think a lot of Gundam fans can be forgiven for being pessimistic. Right. Um, yeah. They, they, they'd I, probably yeah. think it's going to be butchered on screen. It's going to have like a, a terrible kind of, you know, generic story or something like that. Or it's just not going to make sense. I don't know. A lot of things can happen. For all we know, they can start out great. And then on the cutting room floor, like the actual good story gets destroyed. We don't know. We'll see. Yeah. And we end up with Pacific yeah. Rim 3. Which I hope not because... Gundams move lightning fast compared to those <laughs> those Jaegers. <laughs> so rounding this out back to the original topic of the episode was how, you know, what is the state of Gundam America and how does Sunrise make it bigger? So I think, like we said, um, Gundam is ascending be- due to the yeah. advent of streaming. And how do they make it bigger? I think this is their answer for how to make it bigger to a general American audience. True. Of, and that's the live action blockbuster movie. Everyone's going to go gonna go see it whenever it you know i assume that this is gonna be a summer movie certainly hopefully yeah so that's that's that side but the other side is maybe the other audience maybe is a little bit younger you know they've grown up on streaming at this point um so that's probably people in their teens and 20s the way you make it bigger there is just release a new series and put it on netflix gundam unicorn seems pretty successful it's on basically every streaming service that it can be probably intentionally by sunrise thinking this is our best uc offering we've got for a modern audience so let's put it out there it might be the best gundam series overall and i don't mean oh you know how can you say that the original is this think about it right it's got a really good story it's got really good animation it's just beautiful to look at and enjoy and it's, it's a complete kind of you know, unit on its own because they talk about the past and then you, you don't have to know too much to jump into it Exactly. So even if you don't yeah. know the history, you could want to watch it just based on the way it looks. Yeah, they'll fill you in. So they'll they'll draw you in. So um, so while I think the the live action movie is is how you get the the general public to know what Gundam is, I think they their other plan is to continue on the the animation front by releasing something something new. I think if you look at what they've done over the last two three years. I think this is a, a, their real two prong strategy because they announced that live action movie in 2018, and also in um, 2018, they announced what they called their UC Next 100 project. They didn't give a whole lot of details at the time, but basically it was this it was this poster, and it said, you know, we are going to take UC into the next hundred years after Charge Counterattack, after Unicorn. 
And there, that project was composed of three, there was supposedly three things announced. The first, the first project was a, it was called Gundam, it ended up being called Gundam Narrative or Gundam NT, came out in 2018. It was a, like a standalone film. It was basically the sequel to Gundam Unicorn. It, it like loosely adapted the last Gundam Unicorn novel, uh, which involved uh, some people searching for the the third unicorn unit uh, known as the the phoenix it was basically like a like a gold unicorn um that that film kind of has middling reviews i don't know i haven't actually seen it um it was released in american theaters i think for one day um <laughs> so I, I think it's i think i think right uh, sunrise and right stuff are putting it on blu-ray this year or if if they haven't already um but certainly it would be worth a watch if you've already seen unicorn might as well uh, yeah I mean, God, this, <laughs> those poor people in the U, the UC, in the Universal Century, this this war never ends. <laughs> it just, just keeps going, baby. It's like <laughs> we can't stop fighting now. There's one more gun. <laughs> Anaheim Electronics is always doing something. But wait, we uh, just had peace. <laughs> nope, nope. got to make some more money. <laughs> Put it on another Gundam. Um, the second project is what's basically coming up next. And that is uh, Mobile Suit Gundam uh, Hathaway's Flash. So I, I think really Hathaway's Flash is their strategy on the streaming side, or, or basically the, the animation side, which can eventually go to streaming, you know, to the maybe people who are more used to watching anime. Uh, and then you, you know, if you pair that with the live action movie, you're sort of expanding your audience in in all areas. That way, if someone who's never heard of Gundam, which that's the the person we think is their goal for the live action movie, they're going to watch that movie and say, "Wow, Gundam's really cool." And they get home from watching it. They're going to go to Netflix. And what are they going to see? They're going to see Gundam Unicorn. And then they're going to see something that comes right after Gundam Unicorn, which is Hathaway's Flash. So they can you know, get really into the movie. And then, boom, they have a whole nother, you know, each what each OVA, each Unicorn OVA is like, what, almost an hour, 45 minutes-ish? Something like uh, that. Yeah. That, it feels that, like two that, hours. <laughs> yeah, that's seven. Yeah, maybe. I don't even remember how long they are. Maybe they're longer than that. But that's a whole nother seven to ten hours right there. Plus, they can watch Hathaway's Flash, which it. By then, they'll probably all be out, and that'll be another three movies they can watch. So I feel like they're building up this sort of ecosystem that people can kind of kind of play in. And so I think we should maybe talk a little bit about Hathaway's Flash, because I think that's uh, something that we always thought was, was pretty neat back when, back when we were reading about it, reading plot synopses of it back in the early 2000s. What do you remember about Hathaway's Flash? What I remember about Hathaway's Flash is... That Without old, giving away the big spoiler. Oh, boy. All right. Um, <laughs> well, it takes place in the Universal Century after Shars Counterattack, and it mainly focuses on uh, Bright Noah and his son, Hathaway. It takes place in Universal Century uh, 0105, which is 12 years after Shars Counterattack, and I guess that would be nine years after Gundam Unicorn. I think Gundam Unicorn's what? UC-96, right? Yeah, Unicorn is pretty close right after Shard's Counterattack. And so Hathaway's Flash is um, another, this is going to basically be a novel adaptation. So there were, it was three novels written by the original creator of Gundam, uh, Yoshiyuki Tamino. Those novels were released in uh, 1988 through 1990. And those novels were actually a direct sequel uh, to the novel version of Shard's Counterattack. And like Isaac said, so it's it centers on Hathaway Noah, who's the son of our one of our favorite characters, uh, Bright Noah, the captain of the the white base from the original Mobile Suit Gundam. In Charles Counterattack, he's kind of this, I don't know, how would you describe him, like a good-natured kid? He's naive and innocent for someone that's living in that universe. <laughs> right, especially for someone whose dad is Bright Noah, right? Well, he's Bright seems like the type of father that would very much shelter his children from the horrors of war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I guess maybe Hathaway was just like at home with with Mirai the whole time, yeah. like he didn't really know. I mean, Bright Noah's from Earth, so maybe he was allowed to go to Earth and just kind of avoid the worst of everything. <laughs> yeah, could be. Grew up on like living in a a green pasture. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess when the story starts, he's he's using a new name, um, Mafti Navu Erin, and he's he's either joining or eventually going to lead a terrorist organization uh, called Mafti. And that that organization's goal is to fight against corruption in the Earth Federation, uh, particularly due to the Federation starting to deport basically undesirables uh, from Earth uh, to to the colonies. So basically, they're they're giving away the Earth to the to the privileged class, which you know you could argue there's a lot of parallels with that today. So it's yeah. a very it's a very timely release, I think. 
I mean, I also thought the Federation did that way back when. I mean, pretty much everybody that's in a colony now is the descendant of someone that was undesirable, <laughs> right? It always seemed like there was just such an undercurrent of hostility when people find out someone's like from Earth, you know? Like, like I, I forgot who Bright Noah ran into, but like in the, one of the first episodes, they're like, "Oh, you're you're one of the Earthborn elite or something like yep. that." They're very sarcastic about it. So, no, you're right. I think it's always yeah. been through through dialogue. I think it was always pretty clearly established uh, in the Gundam universe that if you were living on Earth and you were you were part of the the elite or the privileged class, yeah, or you're at least quite lucky, right? Yeah. yeah. In, in this series, he he pilots what's called the the Kasi Gundam. And the the antagonist Gundam is called the Penelope, and we always liked these designs because they were they were made in the late '80s. Um, there was like the peak of the what I would call like the elaborate '80s designs. <laughs> they look ridiculous, but also ridiculously cool. They have like so many parts on them, and just it's it's pretty cool. You should you should look them up. There is something interesting here because Hathaway's Flash is a direct sequel to the novel version. Of Star Trek Counterattack, I, I looked up what the differences were between the the novel version and the film version, mm-hmm. and actually, there's kind of a big one here, which really influences the story. So, um, slight spoilers for Star Trek Counterattack, but in, in the in the film, Amaro Ray's love interest at the time, Chan, she kills uh, this girl named Quest Pariah, and that Quest is is the girl that Hathaway has sort of fallen in love with in the movie over a period of like you know two days i think uh typical teenager love at right i don't think they Puppy didn't know each other love. that long right no it was <laughs> <laughs> they like ran into each other twice I think. yeah and then they like he, he knew that he just loved her or whatever so um, anyway he, he's out and he he basically sees chan like kill quest um and that you know that obviously upsets him but in the novel version of charge counterattack which hathaway's flash is a sequel to hathaway is actually the one that accidentally uh well, he, he he kills Quest, but accidentally, um, and that apparently has a a, a big um, impact on his decision to join this terrorist organization. You could certainly find a way to write around that. Um, I just kind of found that interesting. Do we know how long it's going to be? So Hathaway's Flash has has been planned to be a a movie trilogy. I think basically just one movie for each novel. Okay, I was going to say from what I remember of the story, it's not a very long story. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it'll be. Um, it can't be fifty three, episodes. Three, yeah, no, it won't be. A, it won't be a full series. I think there's been th- at least three trailers slash teasers released. So there was one trailer released like early in 2019, which is actually really funny because in that trailer there was text on the screen, or either the the narrator said it. Um, the narr- narrator was in Japanese, so I don't know what he said, but it said like, "Once thought impossible to adapt, this is you know we are now going to make Gundam Hathaway's Flash." And I just think that's a really funny thing for the uh, you know for Sunrise to admit that they thought this story was. It's never going to be adapted. I wonder why they thought that was, whether it's because it was the content or because of the, the mecha designs. But that's kind of funny <laughs> to, to, to not only admit it, but then put it in your trailer. The mecha is pretty over the top. I wonder how they're going to address it, if they're going to, what, what the hell they're going to say about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't even like, for those of you who, you know, I guess we can put links to the the, yeah. the, the suits or whatever. But the, like the Penelope, for example, it looks kind of like a dragon almost. Um yeah, it's like a. Imagine a Gundam wearing like a, a cape. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 very strange. Uh, it looks super cool though. It, it's it's so uniquely awesome. Peak '80s elaborateness. And then there was another trailer release in later 2019, uh, which actually shows you. I think it's the Penelope floating through the or falling through, uh, either the inside of a colony or Earth. So you get a, you get a brief glimpse of it, and right away you can tell that it looks. Doesn't look like any other Gundam that you've seen before. No, uh, that silhouette looks like a mobile armor. If you were like a pilot, yeah. you saw that thing, you'd be like, "Really? They're bringing out mobile armors?" <laughs> well, you, <laughs> if you were a pilot, you'd probably just fly the other way. You'd be like, "Well, that whatever that is, it's gonna kill me, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna leave." I don't know. I, <laughs> mobile armors don't have a good track record. I think a, a pilot would uh, would be too scared <laughs> if he had, a, especially if he had backup in the. Well, ocean. only I guess only they only have bad track records against Gundams, though. You got me there. <laughs> if you're if you're in a you know I don't know what they're piloting at this point like GM threes or or something or no, more uh, Jagans, GMs but... are gone. GMs are gone. We're like a Noahs and Jigans and all that by now. The Jigans are probably gone too. Where it's something else. I don't know. Yeah, you know, that Penelope silhouette is like scary as hell, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. So I can't wait to actually see it animated. Um, and then they released another 
another trailer in late March of this year. So yeah, I definitely encourage everyone to, to check that out. If anybody's seen the trailer, do you think those guys we saw in the pirate mask and the uh, the pirate hats and skull mask were crossbow and vanguard? I don't know. I think those are the uh, well. Anti-fiction. I don't actually know. I, I mean, neither Isaac nor I have actually read Hathaway's Flash because I don't even know if you could find a translated version. But I assume that the person in the pirate mask or whatever you want to call it is either part of the Manhunter squad that is going and finding these undesirables to deport them, or that could be people from the the Mafia organization trying to hide their identity since they're terrorists mm. or whatever. I know we had discussed maybe that was like some some Easter egg for uh, you know Crossbow and Gundam or, or F91 or something like that. I did discover that, um, I guess I don't know this for sure, but it does seem like Tomino, I think he owns the rights to Crossbow and Gundam. I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that it's never been adapted. So I don't know if they would necessarily put any Crossbow and stuff in there. That's too bad because it looks so similar. It looks like it's from either, you know, Crossbow and Gundam or because, you know, Crossbow and Gundam was a whole pirate ship of Crossbow people. Um, <laughs> or it's, I don't know, looks like it could be proto proto crossbow gundam people or crossbow vanguard i don't know but it looks yeah now that i think about it, it it probably would make more sense that they don't even lead into another story that they just focus on it being you know mafty or i think the federation goons are called like the manhunter attachment or something like that yeah I mean, yeah i don't know if, if someone out there knows uh, who the guy is in the mask let us know maybe you've maybe yeah. you've uh, gotten your hands on a translated version over the last Mm-hmm. 20 uh, i guess this is a 30 year old novel now so someone out there's read it it's been out 30 years <laughs> japanese <laughs> listeners can chime in too. yeah they yeah they, they can they can tell us so hathaway's flash is is the second out of those three uh uc next 100 project announcements the third one which was announced at the same time as the other two um, but i don't think there's really been any any more news on it since it came out which it was basically when that announcement was made there was like this little this little timeline board and uh, you could see you know Gundam narrative on it and you could see Hathaway's flash and then there was something after it um, and it was just labeled Gundam uh, UC2 which would be a sequel to Gundam Unicorn it's pretty awesome yeah yeah which makes perfect sense too because um, Gundam Unicorn did uh, fantastically well for on pretty much all accounts so it makes sense that they would uh, want to make a sequel why not uh, continue the story <laughs> it looks so good <laughs> Yeah, I think that was a lot of people's entry point maybe into UC Gundam. So Yeah. It makes I think it makes a lot of logical sense to continue the story as well as like fiscal sense. Um so yeah, but on that one, that I couldn't really find any other news on that. So I, I think that's just, you know, under wraps for the moment. And that makes sense. They probably want to focus on Hathaway's Flash first and probably want to focus your attention. God, now that I think about it. All right. I don't buy models that much, but Hathaway's Flash has such unique looking models. I like I think I'm gonna have to go for it. <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely we either want like yeah. the the Kasiga or, or the Penelope for sure. Yeah. Can you imagine how much that master grade is gonna gonna cost though? We don't know. <laughs> all right. There's a global recession. For all we know, we're gonna get lucky. <laughs> I don't know, Sunrise, if you're listening and you wanna send us over a couple of Penelope's we'll <laughs> We'll live stream putting them together and talking about Hathaway's flag. We, we promise we won't break them. Yeah. Oh, man. What are the bad guys in? What are Mufti? What, what does Mufti say? Zeon had hail Zeon. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Probably something like death to the Federation. Probably. Or yeah. death to the death to the privileged class. Yeah. But that will be a nice change of pace, right? No Zeon involved for the most part. Yeah. I mean, I mean maybe not. I, yeah. I haven't read it, I guess. So maybe, maybe Zeon does crop up. But, burn the earth well people i'm sure people will reference it because they they've been fighting zeon for like 40 years but um <laughs> from what i read what kind of kicks off the story is zeon the republic of zeon being pretty bought back into the uh, federation we're gonna get you back into the fold now yeah like, all right we had enough of you being independent it clearly didn't work out we're still we've, fighting zeon we've beaten you how many times at this point yeah. <laughs> please please stop she's like you know what you lost your right to self-government i'm sorry <laughs> fight us again if you want but it's not good. Well, you know how it's gonna go <laughs> yeah yeah so those are the only three things that were announced as part of that next 100 project but i guess i would point out that it was you know it is called next 100 not next 10 years or five years so i think a lot of people are really hopeful that maybe we will get either a redone f91 or maybe an f91 prequel because there's a whole series of manga called f90 and and um, silhouette formula uh, f91 
So that'd be you, that, that'd be pretty cool. I mean, you love your crossbone vanguard, so I like my crossbone vanguard. But do you know anything about F ninety? I haven't read too much into it. Um, I, I've never read it. I think I at one point tried to find some some scans of it. I mean, this I you know I highly doubt they ever release it here. Let me ask you this: in F ninety, do you do you recollect if they're still slapping around Zeons or <laughs> early crossbone vanguard? Uh, I don't know. I mean, probably right. Here. Who else would it be? They should just do a Gundam F92 or just call it Gundam <laughs> F and just pick up right after because there's so much to cover between what happened after F91 to get to Crossbone Vanguard. I mean, to get to Crossbone Gundam. You know, yeah, you well, add Victory yeah. Gundam isn't quite a bit after that as well. Yeah, Victory Gundam is, I don't know, like 30 years after Crossbone? Crossbone? Uh, that sounds right, yeah. Man, that war went terrible for the Federation too. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't keep an eye on those colonies, they can really stomp you. <laughs> <laughs> so in um, in Mobile Suit Gundam F90, which is basically a prequel uh, manga series to um, Mobile Suit Gundam F91, which was a, a movie, it looks like it's the Federation versus um, something called Mars Zeon. So it must be a splinter <laughs> faction. Oh, I think I remember now. I remember they also called themselves this. the Old Mobile Army, which I think yeah. is hilarious. I remember now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they're trying. They're shooting at. Um, <laughs> I think they're shooting at Earth with a Federation with a uh, like a mass driver that they turn into a weapon that's like on Olympus Mons. <laughs> oh, yep, you're right. It was learned that the Margeons had converted Olympus Mons into a di- gigantic rail cannon. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that sounds freaking awesome. I guess, but I don't. I'm not too versed on astronomy, but like I imagine they're only. They have like a very limited window for certain shots that they can make. <laughs> You're probably right, yeah. Right, because they have to wait for Earth to be in a certain orbit and then themselves to be in a certain orbit, and then they can only shoot at certain times of the day because Olympus Mons has to be facing. Earth. <laughs> yeah, they they might like you know only get a few shots per year or something. And it's then not a very good like, ah, weapon. No, <laughs> and I'm sure Mars's orbit isn't. You know, they probably yeah. only like, cross each other every few years, so. If they miss, they might be like, ah, we'll try again in three years or something. And does the Federation have, like, weeks to months to, like, <laughs> prepare for the incoming shot? Yeah, they, that's, that's a good point. They can just I'd, set up a solar array and, like, melt whatever <laughs> whatever weapon they lobbed at them. <laughs> it looks like they come back later, too. They came back in a video game for but, the NES. Man, Xeon are like cockroaches, man. <laughs> If you see like one and like and you think you kill them all, there's like some hiding under like the floorboards and then <laughs> they're in the attic or the kitchen or something. But overall, people are hoping that, you know, assuming these three series go well. Now, granted, I don't think Gundam NT probably hit it out of the park, but I don't really see any way that Hathaway's Flash or the sequel to Unicorn, if it ever comes out, I don't see those failing at all. Not with diehard fans, no. And visually, depending on how it looks, I think you know it'll pull in some new people. Because what's good about Hathaway's Flash is that it's going to be almost a standalone story because it's short and is a new character. He doesn't really have piloting experience per se. Yeah, and and I think it could get some, it could get some looks. Like for example, if they put it on, uh, you know, Netflix, a lot of people are going to watch it. So why not? Yeah, I think it, it could get some looks for its. Uh, it's content given the um, political environment that we currently live in in the United States. So there was a article on anime news network where Tomino said that he was happy that after 30 years that Hathaway's flash is going to get animated. But I thought it was pretty interesting what he said. He, he I'm just going to read a little bit from the article. He, you know, he noted that the theme of the novels is what decisions are necessary for modern society. And because so much time had elapsed since their original publication, he read his work again and found himself surprised he said the real world hasn't progressed and may even have regressed because of all the Gundam fans who gave this story the chance to reemerge. Its themes can pierce through this, pierce through society today. This this, this story is kind of about forced immigration and, and uh, privileged class versus you know lower class, and um, that's very very much alive in in today's society. And he was writing about it 30 years ago, and clearly he was thinking that society would have moved on, but he's probably right. I think he's more right than he thinks because, I mean, God, every seri- every Gundam series is always about human conflict. There's inequality. And even in something lighthearted like Mobile Fighter G Gundam, 
we, there's just so much inequality between you know the the wealthy and the powerful living in the colonies, and then everyone else just living on that polluted, just destroyed earth. It's just Gundam's very much a, a mirror to humanity. You know, yeah, it's an anime about giant robots and stuff, but the themes in, in it deal with you know sacrifice, corruption. Oh God, the Federation. It's you know, just when you think they're going to be the good guys, like a, a series <laughs> later, they end up showing just how corrupt they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that the, the Federation, for the most part, has has had the protagonists, but the Federation itself has never been the good guy. No. It's it's a very corrupt, even inefficient form of government, but um, it it still manages to attract a lot of the uh, the well-meaning right. people. Not all of them, but yeah, I guess if you never if you haven't watched a whole lot of Universal Century Gundam, one of the hallmarks, uh, I think, is is just that there's definitely good individuals, but the two sides that you're picking between neither of them is the good guy and they're both yeah. sort of the bad guy. And you're just sort of choosing one that you think is maybe less bad than the other. Yeah. I mean, it's, I would say it's more light gray, very dark gray as yeah. far as comparing the yeah. Federation to Xeon. And you, you can kind of look at Xeon and pretty quickly think, you know, Oh, you know, clearly it's, you know, the space Nazis, the you know space fascists, you know, by the numbers. Um, you look at the Federation and uh, visually they're a little bit more vague as what they are, I guess. You could be, kind of be like, oh, are these kind of the they're supposed to be NATO or the U.S. or whatever? But no, they're kind of more of a – what would a corrupt kind of democracy be like if it had powered over the whole – the Earth, the Moon, and uh, all the orbiting colonies? It, it would be a lot like this where it's not necessarily always in control and the military it does have isn't always – great even though they might have a big military and it's not technically a good democracy i mean we don't really hear much about elections in the in yeah, any no, season I that, yeah There's, i never got the sense that there were elections you know, i don't know how the government runs but it looks like there's some type of assembly and i don't think they're elected yeah but they're there's people in power that make decisions they wear suits but you didn't necessarily <laughs> well, they vote wear for suits, them then. yeah you didn't vote for them, and they don't give themselves title like uh, like Zeon does, as far as being like you know, you know dukes or uh, principalities and all that. But um, you might not have much of a say in the Federation government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, your choices are basically an an at times sympathetic and oppressed group of people who are following some fascists versus a corrupt democracy who who deports undesirables, and both of which have committed acts of atrocities on each other. Oh, God, who's who committed the more more atrocities? It has to go to Zeon, right? Probably. I don't know. We'd have yeah. to tell him up, but just based on <laughs> just based on colony drops. On the top I think. of our head, yeah. The top of our head, Zeon takes the cake. Yeah. But man, people fight for the Federation really hard. They'll fight tooth and nail for that corrupt democracy. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, people fight, you know, really hard for Zeon, even though it's oh, God. Zeon it's hard to find people in Zeon that cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> don't try yeah. to backstab each other <laughs> they just break off into like small groups that can work together you know you got Shar and his faction Gato and his faction oh, whoever that guy was in 8th MS team but I can't see them all sitting around a table deciding on an overall plan like that no it's just never gonna work out they, they'd start killing each other yeah. you know selling and then, poisoned <laughs> and then you, you know then apparently you got these other these other jokers who who go to Mars and build a rail gun yeah. Oh God. How did they even get there? <laughs> All right. We gotta take some troops and like a super weapon, and we gotta send it to Mars. <laughs> I mean, on its face, it sounds like a great idea. We'll, God, we'll see how it works right? out for them. So overall, I think that's I think Sunrise's plan to make Gundam bigger in the United States basically hinges on this this two pronged strategy. You know, led by the live action movie to draw in new uh, new new fans who maybe have never seen Gundam before. As well as continuing, you know, the the Universal Century with these sort of high budget, high quality uh, adaptations of great material that they that they just kind of have sitting around. So, hopefully, it all works out. I I think we're on a great path. I think it's a good time to be a, a Gundam fan. Actually, I think streaming has opened up a whole new reason to be hopeful. Because it's a great, it's a great time. Fifteen years ago, we we would have never imagined that we'd finally be getting a Hathaway's Flash adaptation with with the potential for even more UC stuff after Shars Counterattack. Fifteen years ago, I wouldn't have thought I'd be able to see Gundam on Netflix in English. This is all great. 
the exposure from the shows and from movies is going to be you know great over the next few years. Yeah. All right. So is that going to is that going to be our topic for next week? Fan cast, assuming Universal Century. We'll do the fan cast. What's the one we'll throw to the audience? If you're listening, tell us who you'd like to cast in this Gundam movie. Not everybody. You don't have to do everybody. Just tell us, you know, who you think should play who. Some highlights, you know. Yeah. Your Shars, your Amaros, your Brights, your exactly. Robert Rouse. Give us the names, the characters, and the actors and actresses. <laughs> and we'll go from there. All right. All right, everybody. That'll do it for us down here in the side three. Hope you enjoyed our little update. Don't forget to tell us what you think about Hathaway's Flash and who you would cast in Gundam. See you in episode four, everybody. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and tune in next time to catch our latest episodes of Colony Drop, a Gundam podcast. What would the Gundam cast look like for the Gundam movie? At least your dream cast. Oh, that's where you that's where we play the Sega sound. <laughs>